Today, we are going to be launching our first SciFest Africa webinar. And the topic is going to be the nature of African innovations. Now, I know that uh, Mike has prepared a presentation that he's going to be giving, but you all know me very well. I like to interrupt every now and again, and we'll throw some questions at him. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hand over to you, Mike. You get to do your presentation. And if you have any questions, please type your questions in under the social media. If you are in the, the actual Zoom meeting, type it in the chat as well. And I will try and throw some curveballs at Mike while he's presenting. So over to you, Mike. Right, we're talking about innovation in Africa. And Africa to me is a bright continent. It's a phenomenal place, 54 countries, over 1.2 billion people, over 2,000 languages, and unlimited potential. Of course, when we try to define the nature of innovation in Africa, we need to remember that Africa is part of the bigger world. We're one of the continents, but we're a continent with phenomenal potential. And in order to describe the nature of our innovations, we've got to look at it from the perspective, uh, the global perspective. And as you know, it's been suggested that we're now in the fourth industrial revolution. It's a proposal made by Professor Klaus Schwab. And he quite rightly predicted that radical changes will be brought about by disruptive technologies, economies will be upended and social norms will change. And he made that prediction even before the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Now, why is he calling it the fourth industrial revolution? Well, it's because there were three industrial revolutions before that. In fact, there were many more. There were, even before that, there were revolutions in, in, in the, uh, China, in the Islamic world, in South America. But in the West, we talk, tend to talk about the first industrial revolution being in the 18th and 19th century, where the main source of energy was steam. And we looked at moving from farming to, to industry, from rural areas into urban areas, and the production of iron and textiles, in other words, clothing and, and so on, was one of the main features of that first industrial revolution. Then we moved on to the second one, late in the 19th century, where there were new sources of power, electricity, gas, and oil, and chemical synthesis, basic communications, mass production, fast vehicles developed at that time. Then the third industrial revolution, which many of us have experienced, it was in the 20th century, that's when we developed nuclear power and a mix of renewable energies. And we saw massive advances in electronics, telecommunications, computers, nuclear power, transport, the development of synthetic materials. But to a large extent, many of the 54 African countries got left out of those first three industrial revolutions. We're now in the fourth, and instead of calling it the fourth industrial revolution, I tend like to call it the first post-industrial revolution because it's completely different from the other three. It's not driven by any particular source of energy like oil or gas or coal or nuclear. It's actually driven by data. And some of the words there characterize what this new industrial revolution is all about. Hyperconnectivity means people are connected like they've never been connected before. The importance of robots, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, the internet of things, and so on and so on. And I argue that this is going to be Africa's revolution. Now, why do I not want to call it the fourth industrial revolution? Well, the reason is that I think this revolution is about a totally new way of thinking and doing things. It won't be symbolized anymore by smoke coming out of chimneys. Everything will be disrupted, everything will be different. And I see it as a problem solving revolution and not just a small change, it's a massive change. So it heralds a new anti-industrial way of thinking. It's symbolized by young people in front of laptops doing amazing things, chance to drive a bigger and better step in human progress and to redress past imbalances, a very important point and hopefully 
allow us to move away from a, a materialistic culture and develop a more sustainable way of life. So I argue that this so-called first post industrial revolution is not just about words, it's about a major change of mindset with new tools and greater connectivity than we've ever had before. And it's a prop, an opportunity to solve many global problems. It's capable of undoing the wrongs that the first three industrial revolutions created. And this is where Africa comes in. Now we're we already seeing many uh, many revolutions taking place in our own lifetime. We're moving away from carbon-based power, oil and gas, to renewables, away from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles, away from broadcast and print to internet and robots. Instead of money, labor and land being the most important assets of a business, they are now data and knowledge. The big banks are starting to be replaced by smartphones and cyber currency. We're moving from ownership to rental, from post office to drones. So big changes are being made. Now there's no doubt that those first three industrial revolutions created many opportunities and they did solve problems. There were major scientific discoveries, technological advances. We greatly improved transport, not only of people and goods, but also of information massively enhanced computing power, created jobs and skills. There was economic development, globalization, advanced medical care. But we also need to recognize that those first three industrial revolutions created many problems, not only for humans, but also for all the other inhabitants of our planet, the wild plants and animals. It resulted in the wasteful use of natural resources, environmental degradation, the loss of biodiversity, greenhouse gas emissions, pollution, all of which caused climate change, human and animal health problems, overpopulation, consumption of materialistic culture and inequality and poverty, especially in the third world. So the dilemma that we face as humans is that the thinking that led us to today's problems during those first three industrial revolutions will not lead us out of them. We need to unlearn what we learned before and overcome the cultural and economic barriers that were crafted during those three, first three industrial revolutions using new mindsets. So what's different about the so-called post-industrial revolution? Firstly, for the first time ever, different generations are able to contribute to it. So young people, middle-aged people and older people can all contribute whereas previously it was really only the older people in the elite nations. There's a rapid flow of ideas across these generations. There are new fruitful collaborations uh, among people of all culture, bringing different life experiences and knowledge uh, to the table. And there's a very strong contribution by millennials. And all of this is resulting in new ways of thinking. And Africa is very much part of that. So let's go step back a bit and think, you know, what is the nature of science uh, which underpins all technological development? The first thing about science is that it encourages us to question everything. Science never reaches an end point. It's always work in progress. So we question everything and we do this free of other outside influences such as religion and politics. Science and technology help us to solve complex problems. And I've listed some of them there. And as you can see, many of those impact on Africa. The new way we do science and technology attracts new players. It's not just the baby boomers, which I belong to, but also the generation X's and especially the millennials. And the millennials are characterized by being globally connected, entrepreneurial, and very ambitious, and many of you belong to that group. Another characteristic of modern science is that it accelerates technology take up. And once again, this allows younger generations to become involved in the innovation. They're the figure for a number of people connected to the internet, absolutely phenomenal, and the penetration of cell phones. Um, and in some countries, more than one cell phone per person. 
the internet doesn't just connect us with other people, it actually entangles us. So we're in a, in a web of entanglement with over a billion, uh, 4.5 billion people now. More than half of all people on the planet are connected to one another via the internet. And Facebook alone is 2.6 billion monthly users. Uh, in this graph, uh, we show the, the penetration rates of the internet. In other words, what percentage of a country's population, or a continent's population rather, is connected to the internet. And you see Africa comes last on the list there at about 39% of our people connected to the internet. But that's not the whole story. If we look at it uh, in a different way, in other words, the number of actual users because Africa such has such a big population, we've got a, a phenomenal number of users. 522 million people in Africa are using the internet, behind only Asia and Europe, and well ahead of, uh, for instance, North America. So there is a massive amount of use of internet on our continent. Then the other thing about connectivity in this fourth post-industrial revolution is the internet of things how we are connected to um, objects and devices that are themselves connected to the internet. And the over 23 billion of those connections now estimated to go to over 41 billion by 2025. So all of this has resulted in uh, this post-industrial revolution in us creating what could be called a multi-brained, multi-generational superorganism people connected to one another, connected to the internet of things. And this has created a group intelligence that allows us to do things that we've never done before, to co-create things together. Now let's go back and look at the different stages uh, that we've gone through. The pre-industrial revolution um, led to, uh, right early on, over a million years ago, the controlled use of fire, which of course was a great technological innovation. It allowed people to cook their food and preserve it, uh, to keep warm, and to also fend off predators, and perhaps most importantly, to melt metal and to make tools. Africa has been the cradle of humankind, and many of the earliest uh, examples of human creativity are found in Africa, including South Africa. This is the oldest known abstract artwork, 77,000 years before present. It's a, a, ochre, a piece of ochre with these symmetrical scratches on it. This is what's known as the first chemistry set. It's a new, found in Blombos Cave in the Southern Cape, over 100,000 years before present. And it's evidence that early people were mixing chemicals together for a particular usage. He has the first mathematical device, or oldest known mathematical device, a lunar stick, found in Border Cave in Zululand, 37,000 years ago. And here, uh, an image of the famous Cozy Bay fish traps, which for centuries have been catching fishes in a sustainable way. And a lot of that indigenous knowledge developed during the pre-colonial era has resulted in modern products which are used all over the world. Hudia is a kind of succulent found in the desert regions of South Africa, which Khoisan hunter-gatherers suck the juice out of in order to improve their endurance and, and, and quench their thirst. It's now been made into a modern appetite suppressant. A plant called Lipia javanica has been used in Southern Africa for centuries to repel mosquitoes, and the CSR has converted it into mosquito repellent candles. Now, I'd like to mention here that part of the indigenous knowledge that's so important in African innovation is the concept, the Nguni concept of Ubuntu, uh, which means a whole lot of things, respect, concern, compassion, empathy, and so on, and sharing. And it's all about you cannot be a person alone. You can only be a person through your experience with other persons and the broader environment. And that's the kind of custodianship ethic that we have to develop. Now let's look quickly at the Industrial Revolution. South Africa and Africa contributed uh, to a large extent to them. I wonder how many of you know that a South African called James Greathead 
invented the tunneling apparatus that was used for making the London Underground. There it is, the Great Head Shield. Another famous South African inventor was Trevor Wadley, who developed the tellurometer, the most accurate distance measuring device in the world. Um, and then in the transition to the digital revolution, he has a cyber tracker developed by Louis Liebenberg, originally to capture the knowledge of sand hunter gatherers, but now used um, for other projects all over the world. Moving into the modern era, probably the most famous South African invention, uh, co-invented by Alan Cormack, South Africa's first nuclear physicist, um, the CAT scanner in use in all hospitals worldwide and regarded as the 53rd greatest invention of all time. Another South African invention, CompuTicket by Percy Tucker, uh, first computerized ticketing system in the world 18 years before any other country developed it. And of course, our own Mark Shuttleworth, uh, his many contributions, including open source uh, applications of open source software. And one of the many ways in which you can safely send money home, Mama Money developed here in South Africa. At UCT, they developed a series of apps called Abalobi, which help um, artisanal fishermen to manage their fishery themselves. And Kerry Sink here in Cape Town initiated the South African Sustainable Seafood Initiative, which allows you to determine whether the fish that you're offered in a restaurant are safe to eat and not endangered. And of course, as one of our big science projects, we have the Square Kilometer Array, a phenomenal collaborative project among African countries and also with Australia um, using radio astronomy. And one of the many inventions associated with the SKA is Scarab, which is a reconfigurable application board um, used in that project. And there are many modern South African invention, inventors such as Mulalo Doyoyo, who developed, for instance, a Morigard uh, a roof and, and wall uh, coating uh, made from recycled materials, as well as Sino cell, which is a cementless concrete. And here is Andili Ngopo, who made a major breakthrough, and he was the first person to develop a digital laser, something that laboratories all over the world had been attempting to do. And of course, our own Elon Musk now working from the USA. And I'm sure we're all excited about the launch of SpaceX um, spacecraft that will take uh, astronauts to the International Space Station um, tomorrow. Uh, and that's the first um, time a private company will send astronauts into space uh, from the West. So let's just uh, recap on what I've been saying. I'm arguing we're in the post-industrial revolution, which requires a major change of mindset and new tools and connectivity, new opportunities to solve problems and capable of undoing the wrongs of the past. And what I'm also saying is that Africa to a large extent was left out of those first three industrial revolutions, but we have the potential to contribute massively to this fourth one. Now I'd like to quote from an important African philosopher from Kenya. And this is what he's recently said. The scientific and technological advancements, the military industrial complex, the sophisticated economic, social, and political arrangements of the Western hegemonic model now appear futile in the face of the coronavirus pandemic. Humanity and nature have been groaning with eager expectation for something other than the 500 year European experiment, it revealed itself to be rapacious and genocidal where the world is concerned. The West now lives at such a crazy, reckless speed that it has lost all reason and moral authority as it sinks into the abyss. Here in the global South, he's referring to Africa, we must no longer benchmark with this edifice as a standard for human advancement. No, we do not want to catch up to anyone. What we want to do is to move forward in the company of all men. It's now time for the peoples at the periphery to begin a new history of humankind. After COVID-19, if our desire is human progress, we must create other ways of being. For Mother Nature and for humanity's sake, we must rebuild from the ruins, think anew, 
an attempt to set afoot a new philosophy of man. So those are words from Joe Kabuthi, who is a Kenyan philosopher. He's basically saying that this COVID-19 pandemic and other developments like the post-industrial revolution give Africa a chance to shape a new way forward for humankind. And here's another opinion by an author from Canada called Mark Stein. Um, he's written a book, America Alone, The End of the World as We Know It. And he argues that we are reaching the end of the post-World War II era. Um, and he's given a number of reasons for it. Uh, the demographic decline, in other words, fewer uh, births in Western countries, unsustainability of the Western model, and basically the exhaustion of Western civilization. And recently in one of my writings, I've expressed these opinions. COVID-19 has taught us that we are still very much part of the animal kingdom. We are not superior to or outside of nature. We are still part of it and we are not immune to its checks and balances. Despite our superior intellect and our advanced technologies, an ancient, invisible and simple virus has brought our civilization and its economic systems to its knees. And we now have to scramble to pick up the pizzas. Once again, a major disruption has happened. So what has all this um, got to do with Africa? Well, I would argue that Africa is uniquely equipped to contribute to the post-industrial revolution and the post-COVID-19 pandemic. Africa is characterized by having a strong spirit of entrepreneurship. We've got a wider range of cultures and therefore life experiences and knowledge systems than any other continent. We have a very high percentage of young people. The average age in Africa is only 18 years versus 45 years in Europe. We've got the so-called African diaspora, Africans who lived abroad now returning with their expertise. We've got big science projects like SKA. African people are known for very rapid technology uptake, which means that there's, we're taking a shortcut directly into the digital revolution. We've got little industrial baggage that we're carrying with us, very rich natural resources, and economies that are qu quickly able to transition in response to these new challenges. I just see a few examples of some um, African innovations of late. This is something called Hausa beer, which is a non-alcoholic -al beer, especially for Muslim drinkers, and it's spiced and flavored in many different ways. Um, also on the sort of simpler technology side of things, he has a fellow called James Barithi from Kenya, and he is developing the potential of insect food. Uh, he farms crickets and he makes them into uh, something which is are palatable uh, for humans. He has an interesting innovation. As we know, reading is a very important part of education. Books, getting books out to people is vital. And in the desert regions of South Africa, camels are used to take uh, libraries, mobile libraries into remote areas. This one happens to be in Kenya, but they're all over West and, and, and Central Africa, you'll find these camel um, libraries. Another kind of uh, intermediate technology, this is the famous turtle spare parts car from Accra in Ghana. In Accra, they've got a massive car, spare, uh, spare parts and old cars, um, store area, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of bits and pieces of cars. And their mechanics get together and they make vehicles out of these spare parts. And no two vehicles are the same. So they have the sort of generic name of the turtles. But as they roll off the assembly line, whatever spare materials they've been able to find, they've put together uh, to make a functional car. At the other end of the scale, there are many African countries who've developed their own um, vehicles, many of them off-road vehicles to suit African conditions. And here's one example from Tunisia uh, called Wally's car. Of course, Africa, and especially Kenya, is known for the phenomenal 
innovations that have been made uh, in the field of mobile uh, finances, fintech. Uh, M-Pesa developed in Kenya, uh, almost certainly by a student at the Kenyatta Center of Technology called Ndaka Anyoni Oyoko, although Safaricom have now claimed it, um, is one of the most advanced um, smartphone payment systems in the world. Others include Opay and Paystack. How about this in Tunisia? It's a Robocop called um, P-Guard, which is roams around the streets, asks people to show their documents, which indicate that they are allowed to be out when the curfew is on, photographs the document, sends the information back to headquarters. Uh, so without having to send a human cop out who might get infected, this robot is serving that purpose. The same company called Innova Robotics in Tunisia has developed this decontamination robot, which goes around and, and sprays uh, decontaminant around. Right here in Cape Town, the Tigerberg Hospital, we have this uh, medical assistant called Quinton, it's a robot that goes through the wards and does various basic functions to support the medical doctors. So anyone who thinks that Africa is not advanced in that technology really has to think again, because my research and the research of many other people have revealed that we're really at the cutting edge in many modern fields of technological development. Here are some robots that were not made in Africa but they're being used in Rwanda. They were donated by the United Nations Development Program, and they're also supporting the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Here's an interesting app developed by Henry Forietta from Cameroon. It's called Save the Chicken app. And it's a sort of one-stop shop for how you can, as a small scale poultry farmer, chicken farmer, take your chickens right through the whole production process. Everything you need to know about chicken farming is on that app and you're also able to ask questions of experts and get answers. Here's another example, two um, South Africans developed something called Corona app, which provides accurate information about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, also indicates what information is not accurate. Here's another great African invention by Brian Gitter um, of Kenya. It's called the Matiscope, and it's a bloodless malaria test uh, that can be used in the field. It gives a very quick and accurate result. And I just mentioned in that regard that right here in Cape Town um, at the UCT, um, a one pull malaria treatment has also been developed that will soon uh, be available. Here in Rwanda, a man called uh, Keller Renardo on the right, he's developed this drone that is used for de um, delivering emergency me um, medicines, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, but also um, afterwards. And there is also a, an American company called Zipline that is now in Africa and has formed agencies throughout the continent to develop medicines. Another little innovation, a solar powered backpack uh, developed by uh, this young lady. Uh, as the kids go to school, it gets powered up. Uh, it can then provide light and, and batteries uh, for use on cell phones. And here's a man from Ghana who's developed a, st a style of pa uh, paving brick from plastic waste and a very innovative project that first developed at Musenberg in Cape Town uh, is now being um, implemented all over South Africa and also in Liberia. It's Waves for Change, using surfing uh, to teach people um, life skills and um, school them in the skills they'll need in their future lives. Now, how about this? The dancing pallbearers of Ghana. These are chaps who I take the coffin along at a funeral and they dance as they do it. And the message they're giving is that if you don't wear a mask and you don't self isolate, then we'll end up dancing for you. 
And there's just no end to innovation in Africa, in Kenya, in Nairobi, a new hairstyle has been developed called the coronavirus hairstyle. And who would have thought that a hair hairstyle would have an educational message? Because the kids and the young ladies wearing this hairstyle take the message out into the community that coronavirus is something deadly serious that we need to um, face head on and uh, solve the challenge. And something else that's very characteristic of Africa is the way in which people, musicians, um, artists, sculptors, and so on, become involved in helping to solve problems. One of the most famous musicians in Africa is Bobby Wine, Bobby Wine of Uganda, who's also a politician. Uh, he's a member of parliament, and he is in fact currently campaigning to become president of Uganda. But he uses his popularity and especially his music to teach people lessons about the COVID-19 crisis and previous medical crises that occurred um, in Africa, um, a very important role that he's playing. So I'm gonna start wrapping up now and ask the questions, what should we do? We need to recognize the unique nature of technology in Africa, and I'll come back to that in a moment. We need to make STEM, science, technology, mathematics, central to African culture. Promote big science projects like SKA, encourage young people to follow careers in STEM, and raise the profile of African scientists, technologists, and inventors. And one way we can do that is by supporting SciFest Africa. I really hope that in future, African scientists and inventors will have the same profile as musicians, as sports people, as, as those on TV and, and films, because they're making as important a contribution as anybody else. So what is the nature of African innovation, taking into account everything I've said so far? Firstly, we contribute to innovation at both a high-tech level, such as the SKA project and, and robotics and artificial intelligence, smartphone technology, as well as the low-tech um, side of things. A lot of African innovators are addressing urgent on-the-ground needs of their fellow citizens, but at the same time, there are others contributing to global science. Perhaps more than any other continent, our innovation is supported by strong indigenous knowledge systems, a phenomenal knowledge of uh, plants and animals and the natural world around us. We're also characterized by rapid technology uptake and taking that technology from elsewhere and adapting it for local uses. We also very cross-disciplinary in our approach. We work in the boundary between different disciplines, which is the most fertile area of innovation. And my research has revealed that a lot of our innovation is driven by young people and by women. On the downside, African science and innovation is not as well organized and coordinated um, as it should be. I think if it was better coordinated, we'd all be able to support one another a lot better. And also the nature of African innovation and the extent of it is hardly known. I have struggled to find a single book that talks about um, science and technological innovation on the whole African continent. And for that reason, I'm writing one myself, although I'm not the most qualified person to do so. So just to mention the books that I have written on African innovation, this one in 2015, Great South African Inventions, published by Cambridge University Press. This one came out in, in 2018, published by Jakarta, called What a Great Idea, Awesome South African Inventions, covers over 700 inventions. And the one I'm busy on is called Harambi, the spirit of innovation in Africa. And Harambi is a Swahili word, which means let's all pull together. And the topics that I cover are the history of innovation, innovation across different disciplines in different countries, the technology uptake, the factors that promote innovation in Africa, the unique nature of African innovation, and I then end by arguing that Africa is the bright continent. So thanks very much for listening to me. 
Uh, there's my email address if you want to make contact with me. Steve, over to you to handle questions and answers and uh, to generate further discussion. 100%. All right. So are you going to stop sharing your screen there so we can see you? And there was a request. Uh, are you willing to part with your presentation to share I with other people? I'm not. I, 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 Steve, I'm very happy to share my publications that I've coming out. I'm happy to share information and individual slides, but unfortunately, I'm, you know, something that's taken me years to develop, I can't just give it away. I see. Okay, so to so those of you who heard, but of course, if you are watching this, uh, the YouTube, I mean, the, the Facebook video is available. So if you need to show parts of that, uh, people can actually watch it. And, and, and who better to, to describe the slides than Mike himself? So I think that's a, a very valuable uh, tool. Now, Alette, you wanted to say something about um, Prof. Bruton's faith in, 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 I, in Fourth Industrial Revolution. Do you want to unmute yourself and maybe ask your question? Let's just see if we can get that happening. Hopefully you're not too shy. There we go. Uh, just unmute yourself there. Unmute myself. Yeah. There we go. Uh, thank you, Professor, for a very interesting uh, talk and some great examples. Um, I'm uh, very interested in the uh, idea of these kind of innovation debates, but I think we also need to be quite careful uh, around them because there are a number of risks, and I think we need to kind of like actively step into the space to make sure that we kind of like legislate and put things in place. Um, possibly looking at uh, examples from from China. I believe they they built a hundred engineering universities over the past ten years or so. Um, but like I'm like cautious. For example, the in the banking industry uh, recently, um, I think everybody's noticed that you now have all these chatbots that talk to you. You know, as my banking app or whatever. And we've seen thousands and thousands of people being retrenched because of that and banks closing, et cetera. And um, yeah, I think we, we need to stay mindful of things like, you know, encouraging jobs. Um, uh, I think we really need to step in and, and make things happen in terms of creating kind of hacker cultures in South Africa. Um, I've done some research in township-based hip hop communities. And it's quite extraordinary to me how young people um, you know, work and like disassemble computers and learn an incredibly, you know, detailed skills around that, much more so than, you know, a very sort of institutionalized school space where you have to sit and behave. They, you know, strip their computers and take them apart. And I think we need to, you know, work with our government to create more of those kind of spaces. So, you know, not just have faith this is going to happen, but actively, you know, try and uh, come up with things to, to help it happen better. No, yeah. That's it. Well, if I could respond to your original question, and that is the risks. There's no doubt there's a risk associated with the development of technology. Every technological advancement can be used for good or for bad. The family car can be used to take the family on, hosp uh, on holiday, or it can be used as a car bomb. And what worries me is that the rate of advancement of technology, we're not keeping up um, the ethical side and the, the, um, the ways in which we can safely use this technology. There are many threats posed by technological advancement that is going too fast. Uh, you know, one thinks of digital banking and all the cybersecurity risks associated with that. And it's certainly something that we need to be aware of. And it needs to be built into the culture of innovation to uh, how we can uh, mitigate the risks, reduce the risks, and make it uh, safe for people to use different technologies. As far as uh, opportunities for young people to develop outside the formal um, school environment, I agree entirely. There are many, many um, technolo technology hubs developing around um, Africa. I know of 17 of them just in Cape Town. And in my research, I found um, in 
several countries in West Africa. There are academies teaching young people about robotics, about drone technology, about artificial intelligence. So we really have a very rapid technology uptake in, in Africa, which I found to be very uh, positive development. I, I'm, I, if I can just add to that, obviously being someone in the educational sector, what we have noticed is the, the glaring digital divide. And, and as this COVID-19 pandemic uh, is prolonged, we're starting to see that that divide is getting bigger and bigger, simply because people are having to choose between a meal or data. Because if you want to educate your child and you can't access the WhatsApp classes or the Zoom classes or whatever it is that you're having, uh, the reality is that you have to make tough decisions. And some kids, for example, will be able to completely do all their work through the online management systems that the schools are using, and others have got zero access to devices, zero access to internet, and I think that that is so more obvious now than it's ever been before. And this is not going to be our last coronavirus. This is not going to be our last pandemic. We are going to have things in the future. And, and what, what we need to ensure, and, and you were talking about this in, in terms of mitigating the risk and, mm -hmm. and all these sorts of things, is if we don't take these things into account, then that, and, and I think from an ethical point of view, as, as the leaders in whatever industry we're in, if we don't take care of those issues now, then what's going to happen is when things get worse, those divides are going to get further apart and, and we're going to lose a whole sector of our community to, to the fact that they are not actually getting equitable education and, and, and resources like everyone else. But Steve, mm. it's also been argued that in fact the COVID-19 pandemic which has forced people into isolation and resulted in a lot more, for instance, video conferencing and, and, and digital communications is actually closing uh, the digital gap. Um, I know that many universities which who are having to teach online now have provided laptops for their students. Some universities, uh, more than a thousand laptops have been handed out to students. And, you know, so from that perspective, the feeling is that the COVID-19 pandemic has actually accelerated the rate at which the digital economy is developing in this post-industrial revolution. And I, I think, you know, that potentially is a very exciting development. Well, I, I mean, if we talk about lowering the cost of data, uh, access, to, you know, cheaper devices, um, we then going to have this wonderful connectivity but Alette, you were indicating that, yes, mm. that it does have its pitfalls. You know, that when you have all of these things, it means we also going to mean that you know, I don't want to physically go to a bank to go do my banking. I can get the bots and, and everything else to do that for me. And, and eventually those kinds of opportunities for, for, for work employment will close. But in what you were saying, Mike, I've already seen it now. If I'm not in the classroom, I don't earn an income. So since... March the 27th, I've earned no income being in the classroom. So I've had to take my entire business model and move it online. And, and I have a fear that that might become a norm as opposed to reverting to my old methods again. I might start doing everything online and then never having to set a foot in a classroom, which would be very sad mm -hmm. because I would miss that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there is something to be said for more students having computers, but um, I think, you know, at the same time, our students are signing, you know, very scary agreements on the cost of these devices, and they also not that powerful, and also, yeah, so there's that sense of, you, you have to be very careful, they're in spaces, where it's very difficult to learn often. You know, I've had, I've struggled to get assignments from students. Uh, so I'm, you know, for me, in terms of, if we look back at those hackers from the people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and them, they all developed this fabulous technology in their garages. Uh, and they kind of were allowed to mess around quite substantially, you know, um, play around. To, so, I think we need to create spaces where students can do can do that uh, and young people can do that. So I've seen some of that happening in this kind of hip hop study that I've done. Um, 
where people, you know, strip computers entirely. And I think we need to build on that as South Africans in terms of getting into this fourth industrial revolution. We need to um, find ways because I'm a bit worried because you know, I've, I've done a lot of videos in schools around computers, putting computers in schools. And because, you know, the teachers are so worried about these computers getting broken by the students and, um, you know, they're worried about the things getting stolen and the kids are hardly ever allowed to touch anything. And if their computers are broken, they just sit there. Well, in these backyards, young people are fixing their own computers. They're opening it up. They're finding out how to replace the RAM and the, the, that kind of thing. So I think we need to enable these kind of like, I think they're called maker spaces. And I, I, as you pointed out correctly, Mike, those are starting to happen. And um, I think we need to find ways to really make that happen more intensely and to, to look at, you know, this idea of uh, making sure that we don't just have, you know, one or two superstars and everybody else ends up unemployed because their jobs yeah. have gone to some platform somewhere else. Mm -hmm. If I could comment on that, I mean, students are a really important part of our population, but there's a vast, you know, community outside of that. And one of the most exciting things in Africa has been the way in which people who don't bank, have bank accounts, so-called unbanked people, are now able to um, do financial transactions through their smartphones. And mm -hmm. this... Africa is actually leading the world in that regard. And in, it's happening in, in, in South Africa, but particularly happening mm. in Eastern and Western Africa, where um, unbanked people are being able to run and develop small businesses, make financial transactions, do trade uh, simply through their cell phones. Steve, are there any other questions? Um, well, before we get on to the other questions, um, I've just been asked to remind you all that, uh, of course, this is not the end. There are way more um, uh, adventures to, for you to join in on. And I've been asked to just say that if you want to communicate more about these sorts of things, please send an email to info at scifest.org.za. Info at scifest.org.za. And of course, if you want to email suggestions of topics or individuals that you would love for us to interview or, or have them present on the webinar platform, we would love to hear your input. And of course, the next webinar is set for the 9th of June. And if you follow SciFest Africa on their social media, you will find out who is going to be the next speaker. All will be revealed quite soon. And of course, um, this is Africa Week and Africa Month, and that is probably uh, the, the main reason why we've also chosen to talk about African innovation. Now, we've only got about five minutes left. Um, what I wanted to chat to you about, Mike, before we get on to um, our closing is in terms of intellectual property and, and the protection of ideas, one of the things that I've noticed is around the world, uh, there's quite a sophisticated culture of protecting uh, intellectual property. So let's say, for example, I'm at a sci uh, um, a, an expo and I come up with a great science expo project and I notice that all of a sudden there are business people circulating around this expo because they are there to pick up their next best idea, buy it for a song because for a student, if you come along and pay them, you know, 10,000 Rand, they'll go, oh, I'll you can have it. You can have it. It's just a, a science project but that could become the next big commercial success. So, so in terms of you know, innovation in, in South Africa, what sort of mechanisms do we have in place to protect the intellectual property of, of um, people who, who might not even have access to lawyers and that sort of thing? Yeah, this is a big issue, um, Steve. And a colleague of mine, Graham Murray, once suggested that we should start a whole new way of registering patents whereby they registered digitally uh, and uh, the, uh, the time and date on which a patent is registered is then recorded on this global database and no one can uh, change that and predate it because it is an expensive and onerous system to get some, an idea uh, patented um, so that you know, others don't take it to the market. But 
equally, you know, as with open source and, and many other developments, there is a tendency for people to want to share their ideas, to pool ideas, bring similar ideas together for the communal good. So there, there, there's two, or not so much competing, but alternative ways of, of doing things. But definitely, you know, securing one's rights um, to an invention is something that we still are grappling with. I can imagine. Well, I mean, this is what I have found is that, you know, sometimes people invent things or they innovate uh, when there is a need. And, and I think that COVID-19 has created the right environment where people are now forced to come up with innovative new ideas because of their circumstances. So if you could make any predictions, what sort of innovations do you think will start coming out over the next couple of months because of COVID-19? Well, firstly, it, it's well known that crisis situations such as wars, pandemics, um, natural disasters and so on are major promoters of innovation. Um, so, you know, it's not surprising that, that they will arise out of this pandemic. I, I think that the kind of things that will come out of the pandemic are improved ways for people to communicate with one another, improved ways to kind of um, demystify complex processes. There's an interesting app that's been developed in Nigeria called Budget, in which um, the complex way in which the Nigerian budget is, is put together and, and money is spent I, is explained in everyday terms to rural people. And there are also, um, for instance, communication systems being put in place on how the Ebola crisis was addressed in West Africa and how the solutions developed there can now be applied to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're learning from past experiences and uh, communicating far better than ever before. So I, I predict that some of the big um, technological advances coming out of this pandemic will be better ways of communicating across all levels of society and across all cultures. Because, you know, the ironic thing is that the major tool that humans use to communicate with one another is language but language can also be the biggest impediment to communication if you can't speak another person's language. So translating services, I think, are also going to be an important part of the future. In Africa, there are over 2,000 different languages and many thousands of additional dialects. And uh, that is uh, a barrier to communication, and we've got to work on fixing it. Sure. Well, I, I know that we're going to have many challenges and many uh, innovative solutions coming out of it. And, and one thing that, that is evident is that, you know, when we talk about African innovation, uh, we're now living in such a global world that, you know, I here in Cape Town and you there, you also in Cape Town, but we have people from all over the world who have joined us and you're watching it live. Um, we have access to a global set of resources. So when we invent something, it's not only just for the South African context, it's also for a global context. Um, what does worry me though, is that, you know, this is the, the moment where big corporates could jump in and say, listen, we've got some of those financial resources. Why don't we uh, harness that to, to, to get some, some income? from, from a, a, a community that is desperate. So if, if you would like amazing tools to help you innovate and come up with new products for your business, sign on to our company. So I have noticed a lot of uh, an increased amount of exposure and advertising, especially in the education market. If you want to innovate your school, you want to become innovative, use our products. We'll give you free access for the next two or three months. And then afterwards, once you've become accustomed to it and used to it, they hit you with a fee if you'd like to continue using the product. So I, I, I do worry that, that there are a couple of companies out there that are taking advantage of the fact that we would like to be innovative and, and maybe we don't have the, the means to afford the tools, but now we get to use the tools for a couple of months and then all of a sudden uh, 
there's a cost to that. Yeah, well, I mean, that's capitalism. And unless we're going to replace capitalism with another system, uh, you know, that's the route we're going to go. But I think ethics is, is creeping more and more into business. And, um, you know, the, the rights of, of rural people and people, you know, on the periphery of the economy are more and more being taken into account. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and I, I know, Freddie, Freddie, you were making a comment there in the chat. Freddie, do you want to maybe make that comment or, or, or would you like me to read it for you? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, Freddie. Uh, and, read it, and read it out. Would you like me to read it out for you? Yeah. He's just having a look at, at what he had written there. Uh, and, and he's got uh, a young assistant there. I'll, I'll read it for you. He said, increased innovations in entrepreneurship uh, as more and more businesses are run from home so that lockdown is more meaningful. Uh, it's a more meaningful use of time and other resources. The tax benefit of home run businesses are endless. And this positions the African household to be a major contributor to a knowledge driven economy which we aspire to. So, so lockdown has developed some new innovations with regards to home run businesses, which, which I think is quite interesting. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of people support that point of view. I've had that point of view expressed to me from people all over Africa that the lockdown has been used you know, productively by people to develop their businesses from home to upskill themselves in terms of their techno literacy um, to learn how to communicate um, you know, in virtual meetings. And I don't think the world is ever going to be the same again. There's going to be more digital connections after this pandemic than there ever were. And we're not going to go back to the original status quo. Okay, and, and just to make a correction, it was actually from uh, Dan Mats uh, Matsapola from uh, <laughs> the Space Agency who, who actually proposed it. I think Freddie was just forwarding it uh, on, on his behalf. Um, all right, uh, apparently we have come to the end of our session, um, and which I, I don't know why, but these things tend to, to run very, very quickly. Maybe we, you know, time flies when you're having fun. But remember that the dialogue is not over yet. If you would like to subscribe, those people on this chat already can subscribe by clicking on the link that was shared. We, um, the team will also share it on their social media as well. Sign up to the um, National Arts Festival and the Science Festival um, mailing list so that you can find out exactly what is going on. There are going to be loads and loads of digital. I mean, look at this. This is a, a, an innovation a national arts festival, a national science festival taking place online as opposed to in person. And, and I think that, you know, when, when people start becoming used to the new normal, um, you can start to look at new and innovative ways of growing an event like this, because then we can have an international event as opposed to a national event. So I, I see a, a lot of pluses in, in it, but, um, Unfortunately, it, it, it doesn't work for everyone. But on that note, I would like to personally thank uh, Prof. Mike Bruton for sharing his, um, his stories and, 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 and accounts on, on African innovations. Uh, we're very excited to, to hear about your book and, and, and hopefully you'll keep us up to date when it's going to be released. Um, Mike has also offered to sign, no, I'm joking, I can't make <laughs> like that. But, but uh, for those of you that, that have been a part of this, we, we really do appreciate the fact that you've joined us. And for those of you who are gonna watch it after the event, please feel free to make contact with the SciFest team at uh, the SciFest address, which is info at scifest.org.za. And for the rest of you for joining us, thank you. And for SciFest, thank you for allowing us to host this webinar. And on that note, we are going to bid you all farewell. Thank you very much. And we will see you all on the 9th of June. Bye-bye, everyone.